central bank digital currencies are not new. What? Central bank digital currencies are coming, whether you know it or not. It is scary to some. Other people have no idea what it is. But today, I have done so much research for you guys. I got a lot of really cool stuff I'm going to show you. I think it's going to blow your mind. I'm excited to show you. So central bank digital currencies are a type of crypto. But instead of being like a Bitcoin or something, some dog coin that you see online, it's going to be a government-backed, government-created created cryptocurrency. It's going to change the way we do everything. One of the biggest countries that do that now is China, that they have a digital currency, but that digital currency is connected to, instead of a credit score, what we're used to seeing, it would be a social score based on other things that you do. You'd be jaywalking or saying something you shouldn't online. You could lose points for that and thus make your interest rate on your mortgages go up. Now, China, we're not really surprised that it's been happening over there. It's a communist country, uh, not as much control. And a lot of people think, well, that's never going to come to the West. It's never going to come this far. But boy, oh boy, I got some stuff that's going to be really interesting to you. All right. So first look this up. What is Ethereum? This is really important. Ethereum is a blockchain. And notice that to help peer-to-peer -peer network that securely executes and verifies an application code called smart contracts. This is the important word, smart contracts. Smart contracts allow participants to transact with each other without a trusted central authority. What on earth does all that mean? So for you guys to know, the two big ones always are Bitcoin and Ethereum that you hear. This is the symbol that you're going to see on the back here. You'll see that it says smart contracts on it. Now, smart contracts are the thing that is going to probably change the world. And imagine this is this programmable money. So as you guys know, I'm a real estate broker, run an entire team in Canada, act as advisors and consultants all over North America and Europe. I've had some pleasure of dealing with some people in Argentina, all kinds of stuff. But here is the thing. When you're going to sell a house, please just think about this. When this party wants to sell a house and this party wants to buy a house, think of the transaction. Both of these parties have to use a real estate agent and a brokerage most of the time. They also are going to have a bank and a mortgage agent, maybe. They're also going to have their own lawyers. And then the lawyers in the center are now going to deal with the public ledger, the address. So it will have this house was owned from 1900 to 1940 by this family. 1940 to 1960 by another family. And it has that public ledger that is available. But think of this, the two parties, the buyer and the seller are both hiring their own brokerage and agent. They're both mortgage broker and their bank and their lawyer. One, two, three, four, five, 10 altogether intermediaries. So you have 10 people trying to be, what was the exact wording that was used there? It says a trusted central authority. That is the basis of everything that we're going to talk about here today. So imagine if now you had a program, an online program, as easy as emailing a Google email. Imagine that email now that it says buyer and seller want to sell the home. And in order for all the names to transact on that ledger, the money would have to be sent from the buyer and send it into the program. And then the legal paperwork, the deed or whatever has to be sent into the program and everything that would have to be done. You don't need the lawyers. You don't need the mortgage brokers or agents or anything else. Everything can be done by the program and it will only transfer the deed once the money is received, once everything. Is, so nothing is sent to either party unless all of the required things happen within the program. And it will not transfer the money, will not transfer the deed until everything is taken care of. My goodness, if you think about the savings that could save, we're talking about trillions of dollars of friction that happen. This system could change a lot of things. And the first people to take advantage of this is going to be the governments. So let's take a look at a couple of these other articles that I have selected for you today. If we look at the United States, which everyone think land of the free, right? This is not all bad. When we're going to look at some of the billing codes of the FedNow service, please look that up if you want. It's on the Federal Reserve website. They're talking about super low transaction payments. If you want to say this is not something that's going to say everything is bad. Imagine that I can send money anywhere in the world for fractions of a penny. Imagine it going to be much safer 
much cheaper. Imagine that instantaneously now all fraud disappears. There's no longer fraud. Imagine somebody comes to you with a hundred dollar bill and then all of a sudden you find out that it's a copy on the bottom. You'd be furious. You just lost your hundred bucks. Imagine no more fraud anymore. All the fraud is gone. Beautiful, right? That would be great. All these people working for cash and not paying taxes. Well, now they would have to pay taxes. That could be a good thing. A lot less fraud in the system is always a good thing. Cheaper, faster, always a good thing. There comes the problem though. Smart contracts is also programmable money. We can put conditions on it to be executed. Remember the program? It will not do anything unless all the conditions are met. What are some of the conditions that we can get? I mean, that list becomes endless. Now, the United States, not a lot of people think that it could happen in a place like that or a place like Canada where I live. Here is the scary part. FedNow 2023 fee schedule. That's this year, my friends. If you go on their own webpage, it'll say the Federal Reserve will take a phased approach to the FedNow service, initial launch targeted for 2023 or 24, we saw in the news that they are targeting July of this year. That's right. It's coming a lot sooner than you had expected. Now, central bank digital currency in Canada, please go to the Bank of Canada website. We are building the capacity to issue a digital version of the Canadian dollar known as a central bank digital currency. This is not far away Star Trek kind of stuff. This is happening right now in front of us. So the central bank, they're doing this in Canada and Canadians can trust and rely should the need arise. That's funny. Should, right? Currently, they don't have plans to do it, but should the need arise. Now, I want you to remember this and go back to earlier in the last couple of years, let's say. Can't say those words on YouTube. But there was a period of time when we first shut down and all of a sudden they were saying, please go spend your money. Please spend your money. Support local businesses. Do you remember that wave? Spend, spend, spend. In late in 2020, early 2021, there was an interesting article in Canada. But listen, this isn't unique. This was all over the place. We had our minister go online. Christia Freeland, and she was talking about Canadians needing ideas on how to unlock the preloaded stimulus. I made videos on this back then because she said people had too much money in their bank account, and that was a bad thing. We don't want you to have cash in your bank. We need it spent. And she said, please give us ways to make people spend that money. So now she wanted it spent. But fast forward from that nine months later, all of a sudden they were telling you, please don't spend money. Inflation is too bad. Don't buy anything. We need you to stay home. If you don't slow down your spending, we're going to have to raise interest rates. People couldn't slow down their spending. Interest rates skyrocketing all over the place, right? And so it's funny to me that when they say, should the need arise? Well, what need are you talking about? I'm curious about. Now, a lot of countries are going to be needing this. Check out this map if you go to cbdctracker.org. We're going to look at this map. Look at the people that are doing research. They're running pilot projects, so on and so forth. If you go to that website, you're going to see there's a lot of countries that are looking into it now. I think there's something like 90 countries that are looking for CBDC now as their answer for all of this stuff. So the big ones that you are always going to see online about crypto, crypto, crypto is Bitcoin and Ethereum. Bitcoin, I want you to imagine it like a playing card, you know, like 50 years ago, Wayne Gretzky, you know, rookie card or something like a sports card, valuable collector. There's only 21 million of them. People have lost like 3 million. So there's only going to be 18 million that can be found. It's like a collector's item. The opposite side is Ethereum, which they are slowing that down. I showed you what the Ethereum symbol looks like, but Ethereum is that smart contract. So all of these countries that are looking into central bank digital currencies, they're all being built off of a version of Ethereum, smart contracts or programmable money. Now, I'm not a tinfoil hatter. <laughs> I'm just saying that first. What could they do? I'm not saying what will they do? What would they do? I'm saying, what could they do? Just imagine, and I know people who work for the government and in times past, if you're on welfare, they would tell you, you can't spend your welfare or your check on booze, lottery, whatever, whatever. They put restrictions on it. Imagine this being able to be planned just with a click of a button. They're able to say with programmable money that this money can only be spent in this certain geographical location. Could it be 
10 miles from your home? Could it be in the province? Could it be in the country? You could massively influence the flow of migration around the world if money would not be able to be spent outside of a certain geographical location. Think about what we've been through in the past couple of years where they were blocking people from moving through borders. This would be an easy way to do that. Also, I'm not picking on any one government. Think of any government on the planet now that may have, say, that we don't want you to use oil or we don't want you to eat meat or whatever the flavor of the day is going to be. Maybe they don't like a certain company or whatever it's going to be. They can make the money reflect that. You've bought too much meat or you got too much gas or whatever. Again, not saying what they will do. I'm saying they have the power to when they have digital currency. Now, I saved some of the best for last, my friends. So my father, my best friend, loved the guy more than life itself. He died five years ago. I couldn't get myself to go through some of his things. And I went through and I found this old wallet that he had. As I opened the wallet up, it had some sleeves in it. And I found some old pieces of paper. This is the coolest part of my presentation. Look at this old piece of paper that he had. Now, my family had come from Germany, but like a hundred years ago, this old, old, old piece of paper. Now it's in German. This isn't going to mean much to you, right? And you're like, wait a second. It kind of looks like money, but what are we talking about? Now in German, what you can see is 31st of December, 1920, right? What are these pieces of paper? So I got digging about this and this is what blows my mind. Central bank digital currencies are not new. What? They're brand new technology I've heard. Oh man, do I have something to show you. Okay, so look at this. Not geld. I apologize to my German friends if I'm not pronouncing it right. Not geld or the money I just showed you is emergency money. Refers to money issued by an institution in a time of economic or political crisis. My question to you is, are we in an economic and political crisis? Yeah, we're getting in more and more of it. Now, this money that I just showed you, this usually occurs when not enough state produced money is available from the central bank. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? If the central bank is running out of money, this is what happens. Okay, let's go back. What is this say? I want you to go type in. We live in Canada, but in the fall, Bank of Canada posted its first loss in its 87 year history, losing half a billion dollars in the third quarter. Now, you guys, we are not the United States. We're a small country. That is massive, massive, massive problems. Hmm. That's kind of crazy, right? So this money I showed you, it is issued during an economic political crisis when there's not enough money from the central bank. Notice that issuing institutions could be a town savings bank or municipalities or private state owned firms. And nearly all issues contained an expiration date. Issues without dates had an expiry announced in a newspaper at the place of issuance. I am flabbergasted. So let me tell you. What I'm trying to tell you about a central bank digital currency is they have the power to, I'm not saying they will, they have the power to restrict money to be a certain area. Hello, these bills were produced by a small town or city and the money was not allowed to be spent. This was not allowed to be spent outside of the little town. Not allowed. Geographic location. These pieces of money here were only able to be exchanged for certain goods and services. If you were paying like city taxes, for example, they would restrict you what you were able to buy with this stuff. That's crazy. Last point. Notice on the back, the date, 31st of December, 1920, saying if you don't spend this money by a certain date, it will expire. I'm sorry, you guys. What did we just talk about right here? When our dear friend, Christia Freeland, she was saying that she needed that money spent, spent as fast as possible. And she was looking for ideas from the public on how to get that money out into the economy. Preloaded stimulus was the word that she used. So you guys, this is kind of crazy to me that I just found this from my dad hundred years ago. Central bank digital currencies were around before, just in a different way. I think this belongs in a museum somewhere, guys. I'm very, very excited about this. So what can we do about it? 
Well, there's nothing you could do about getting rid of a central bank digital currencies. You can't control the government, but what you can do is continue with your right to use cash when you go anywhere and spend cash. That anonymity is part to me of the freedom to be able to buy whatever you want and when you want. I think the real trouble will come not with a coexistence of having a central bank digital currency and actually having paper currency, but when you're forced to outlaw real paper currency and have it in exchange without the other one. Like that would be a problem. Now, when I tell people all of these things, they sometimes get a little bit afraid and they say, well, David, what can I do? And this is what I'm going to show you. This dollar right here is a real $1 bill from the United States. But if we break it down, it's only green ink on paper. That's it, right? If we change this though, and then I bring up another bill, all of a sudden you're like, David, that's a hundred dollar bill, green ink on paper. But I showed you that this was a copy. It's a fake bill but it's still green ink and paper, green ink and paper. It's only paper, you guys. That's what blows my mind. Also, I got something in the mail. I am a billionaire now. This is 1 billion real dollars, a real bill from the Bank of Zimbabwe. But what does a billion buy you? This is only worth a couple bucks, nothing. Could barely even buy you a drink. Also though, ironically, green ink and paper, like all of them, Last green ink and paper, a piece of green ink and paper from 1928, $1 is a real bill. Notice on the top, it says a silver certificate. On the bottom, it says one silver dollar payable to the bearer on demand, my friends. One silver ounce for $1. Today, one silver ounce is worth $30 US, $40 Canadian. So what happened? They printed 30 times more money in the system. So this little coin here didn't change very much. Here is a piece of gold. This piece of gold is from the British sovereigns. But here's what I wanted to tell you. This is about one ounce. This is a one ounce coin. So one ounce of gold in 600 BC in ancient Greece bought you a really nice outfit, really nice pair of shoes. In Rome, 2000 years ago, one ounce of gold, obviously not with the Bitcoin on it, one ounce of gold would get you a really nice outfit and a nice pair of sandals. My grandfather, when he was born, 1910, I think it was, he could buy a really nice suit and a really nice pair of shoes. My dad, born 1945, he could buy a really nice pair of shoes and a really nice suit. Today, a one ounce gold coin could buy you a designer suit and a nice pair of shoes. My point is that this metal, real metal, real silver has not changed in purchasing power in forever. This right here could buy you 30 loaves of bread 500 years ago, 30 loaves of bread 100 years ago, 30 loaves of bread 10 years ago, 30 loaves of bread today. This $1 though went from being able to buy you 30 loaves of bread before and today people would be not even happy if that was a tip. So my point is we have to get into things that retain purchasing power and not look at things and not measure them with what a digital dollar could be. So if you have something like gold or silver, this is stuff that will always retain its purchasing power. We don't use it to make money. Though my father, when he was first buying gold, was buying gold for $150, $200 an ounce. Today it's sitting in Canada at $2,500 an ounce. So did he make money? Well, actually no, he hasn't made any money because the purchasing power is the exact same. So I think that you guys have to be doing some of that. And of course, you know, it depends on who you are and what your risk profile is. Some people do suggest to have some Bitcoin and some Ethereum in your own possession. And remember, always put it on a key. Don't keep it on an exchange like Coinbase or anything like that. You can buy something like a Ledger wallet here. It's especially made, looks like a USB key and it holds your crypto on it. You can get this link down in my bio. If you're looking to buy gold and silver, the majority of people will tell you to put somewhere around five to 20%, I would say 10% of your net worth should be in precious metals. Never, ever, ever keep them in your home. Only keep them in a bank safety deposit box. And there's a lot of companies that you can have it vaulted all over the world in all these different countries. You guys, I make this stuff to try to inspire curiosity, to have you to get knowledgeable about what is happening in the world today, because whether we like it or not, it's coming for us. It's going to change the world as we know it. And I want you to be prepared, you guys. We are not scared if we know what to do. When we were at the beginning, we couldn't ride a bike. We were crying our eyes out. I know I was, you know, my dad was going to let me go. It was scary. But when I figured out how to do it, then it was okay. So we got to figure out ways to be able to preserve our wealth, preserve our family, and be able to make money in this really rough recession instead of losing purchasing power and losing money.
I wish you guys the very best. Please, if this helps you at all, send it to one of your friends. Consider subscribing to this if I've given you any value whatsoever. And I'll talk to you in the next video. Thank you so much for coming by. Thanks so much for sticking around. If you like that video, you might like this one and maybe something like that.